Yes. You oh, thank you. Thank you. I just got a request to start recording. I don't, I assume somebody made that. So I hit the record button, but did you want me to? It was a weird oh, pop-up. Yeah. It was like somebody. Oh yeah, I think we, I think we forgot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So now we are recording. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's um, difficult for some of the U.S. folks to get funding to go to Vienna, um, but I, I think if we can pull in um, others, other cast members from Europe as well, I, I think that'd be great to have more cast talks there. Yeah. By the way, Vienna is a really, really nice city. It's a lovely city. Yeah. Is, yeah. do you know, Luis, is Petergia going to have a booth at, in Europe? I know you did last year. Yeah, I was not aware of these events, so I will ask uh, Danny. Okay. I guess, I guess uh, we can be there, but I have to, I need his confirmation. I was just curious. Yeah, and I think um, just on the topic of uh, conferences, one thing that I um, noticed in um, this conference last week was that uh, there were some OSPOs from Asia that were joining. So Toyota and Sony uh, were there, and um, I'd be curious to hear if they will also be joining the um, the EU one. Um, and to see, and I I believe Sony spoke on like qualitative and quantitative metrics for open source projects. So it'd be interesting to kind of see if what see what they're doing um, and see if they'd be interested in getting involved in chaos or, or the OSPO working group. Um, up next is Dawn. Um, you wanted to talk about practitioner guides. Yes, so we have three practitioner guides that are mostly done. They're as, as done as I can get them. I'm certainly looking for additional feedback. Um, it'd be great if I could get feedback from people on these guides this week, uh, because ideally I'd like to start putting them up on the website next week. So I've already started um, kind of creating the framework for it as a, a PR in the data science working group. Um, repo and I'll start working on um, getting the actual guides up there once once people have had time to review them and I can um, incorporate any feedback that I get. So that's that's really it. I just want to encourage people to give give feedback um, with the reminder that the audience for these guides are uh, practitioners. So OSPOs, community managers, those sorts of folks. So not necessarily data experts. Um, so just uh, keep that in mind as you're providing feedback. And, and Luis, you said that you left comments on the docs, but I don't see comments on the docs. In the, what's the name? in the practitioner guide introduction, things to think about when interpreting metrics. Ah, okay, cool. But th this is the first one, like like this is the very first one, right? Yeah, okay, cool. I will, yeah, thank you. I'll have, so, I'll have so to that. Let, let me know if some some of these ideas uh, make sense to you and I, I'll, I'll kind of elaborate them a little bit more. Okay. Don, how do you see these being organized? Uh, that's an excellent question. I think, I think initially these will just be links. Um, so we'll put them. We'll put. We'll create a section on the website for the practitioner guides, or possibly just for guides in general, because I suspect we'll have um, other other types of guides in the future. Um, so I think that. What we'll probably do, we'll create a section for them on the website, and then initially, I think it will just link to to each of them and let people kind of pick and choose the ones that they're interested in. I think once people start using them, we can look at whether it makes more sense to do something um, different, like put them together in a collection or or something like that. But I'll I'll work with Elizabeth to figure out how we can how we can get them on the website. But they'll probably be just um, just text initially. Okay. 
So Don, I was working on that to do book chapter today. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how these practitioner guides might be used in that chapter. I'm not sure. So when I had originally started writing the chapter, it was like, here are some metrics, like some very atomic metrics to think about. But as we've kind of found over time, it's really hard to just say, here's like one very small thing to look at um, on an issue. And I'm wondering, anyway, I just was starting to wonder today if these practitioner guides might be the best place to leave people from that chapter. You know, as you're reading these chapter here, here's a couple of things to think about and here are a couple of guides that can kind of help move you in, in a direction that might be meaningful. Mm -hmm. just thought. I just wanted to put that out there. I don't know how it fits together yet, but. No, I mean, I think, so certainly like OSPOs are probably one of the primary targets for these uh, practitioner guides anyways. So I think that pointing to them in from the, the book chapter would probably be good. I mean, what we might want to do is just point to like the the practitioner guide page and, um, you know, and let people kind of look at them because we'll continue to add them as time goes on. So we'll have more and more, more and more content as we, as we make progress with the guides. So I like that because um, I think these, <clears throat> any of these chapters in the to-do book are going to have to be pretty simple anyway, like not overload people with info. Like here are a couple areas to think about when you're thinking about metrics and then kind of at the end saying we have these practitioner guides that can help kind of help you consider these areas that we talk about in the book. So then head over there. So I, I like that, that approach. I'll think about it a little bit more, but the, okay. the guides are just so nice because there's not a ton of them, <laughs> to be honest with you. And they don't overwhelm people. Um, and they're less, I find them to be less about like, the details in a metric, but more about how to think about the data that you might collect in some yeah. meaningful way. I think Matt has drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> I but, agree. Yeah. All right. Any other questions about the insight or the, sorry, the practitioner guides? Um, yeah, Don, I know that um, I was just thinking about how Matt kind of framed it and it's like how you think about approaching some of this. And um, for me, um, I really enjoyed like the podcast that Chaos is doing. And so um, I wonder if like there can be an episode for each of these insight guides, because then it's like it adds to more like accessibility to for people who just want to listen um, or it adds a little bit more context of like, hey, here are some practitioners who are thinking about this and are applying it to their daily work. Yeah, I really like that idea. I think that's a good idea. Um, the other thing I'll probably do is when, when we launch the practitioner guides and put them live on the website, I'll probably do a blog post about them just to kind of point people to the page. Cool, sounds good. Awesome. Okay, I think that's all I had on that. All right, well, you all know where to find Dawn or find the insight guides. Um, other things that we wanted, that we had on our agenda um, was to look at um, potential uh, projects for this working group. And um, I think Sophia, myself and Elizabeth are gonna meet next week to continue uh, looking at event location inclusivity um, so we'll update this group when, when we have more on that. Um, and then we kept takeoff and exodus metrics as a potential project. Um, and we also have here to discuss Sophia's MSR talk, but I don't think she's on for today. So um, we could potentially talk about the takeoff and exodus project. I know um, Callie had mentioned um, couple of different things about uh, creating a project around that, but not until after the the conference. And I feel like we're only a few days after, so it might be. Yeah, I was about to say, I was like, I'll be ready to speak on this next meeting, but I need, uh, yeah, I'm still very much in the 
post open source summit recovery turning into a human again mode. <laughs> I think all of us are in this a place approximately there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I feel, I feel like since we're recovering, does anyone have um, like any thoughts top of mind from the conference? I know, I think Lewis, I know you're the only one who um, wasn't there, but um, wanted to check in with others. I, I mean, my main thoughts coming from it, I, I feel like there was a lot of great conversations. I have a really, like, positive outlook of how the week went, especially, like, I think Monday was a very dense day, especially for the people who were involved with the morning session and then Chaos Con, but I was really impressed by the attendance for both, and it seems like more and more people are getting excited about it, and, like, genuine interest we're trying to see people in chat channels and um so excited to see what comes out from like all those engagements yeah i agree i agree it was a very intense day monday and just a lot of discussions throughout the week a lot of chaos presence a lot of discussion of the work that uh, is happening around data science and software and all that stuff. It was pretty good, pretty awesome. This yeah. is only like, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Callie. Oh, I, this is a little bit of a side tangent, but something that I have been thinking about with like, there's a lot of push right now for like ML and AI when I really honestly don't think data science is being applied very well in a lot of aspects, but especially in community. And so I don't really have anything actionable from that statement, but that's just something that I'm observing overall of being like there's so much untapped potential whenever it comes to understanding our space, like more from like data and metrics before trying to hop straight to like ML and AI. And so I appreciate this group for trying to really like do things in a thorough way when it feels like the industry overall is just like trying to jump to the next thing before doing like the initial step well. Yeah, there's a whole lot of noise and garbage around AI, but everybody's rushing headlong into it. And it'd be good if we had a conversation about what we actually think it means. I think that's kind of your point, but maybe not. I wouldn't say that's my point is that more of like, I want to make almost actually kind of maybe even the opposite of like, I want to make sure that we stay focused in doing like data, like on data science and metrics and visualizations really well. Cause I think there's so much untapped potential there and people are wanting to like zoom to doing like modeling and AI before taking all of the rich information that can come from like data and visual, like visualizations and metrics. Yeah, agreed. I, I get that a lot where people hear that I'm a data scientist and just assume that all I do is ML and AI. And I really, frankly, just don't do, don't do any of that. There's, there's lots of other stuff that that is important around, uh, you know, understanding data and generating meaningful insights out of it that isn't necessarily machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yeah. Most of it's not to Kelly and to Kelly's point and your point. Um, yeah. The other thing that I thought was really great at this um, at OSSNA that I think I think we saw more of than we have in the past was other other people talking about how they've implemented some of the things within the Chaos Project. So, you know, seeing all of the work that Remy's team has done, their joint presentation with with Microsoft, for example. And just just hearing how people are using our metrics and and tools to, you know, to learn new things about their open source communities. And so it's been it was really interesting to see a lot more of that. So it was it was less of what I what I would sort of call like the usual suspects. So like you know, 
me and Georg and Sean and Matt doing presentations and a lot more presentations from from other people, which I thought was really great. Yeah, I agree. And, and Remy's team, I mean, the things they did with the Nadia Eggball numbers, uh, classifications for projects, is pretty, pretty helpful heuristic mm -hmm. for thinking about open source projects. And I, I think they did a number of a couple of lightning talks in addition to a couple of plan talks. And so just, uh, yeah, a lot of contribution coming out of that team right now. Yeah, for sure. And as always, it was a really nice excuse just to spend some time and talk to some of the folks that uh, we work with in the community face to face. So that was that was always really great. I know every time I walked by the chaos booth, that was, um, you know, there was usually somebody standing there uh, talking to us. And so I feel like we we had a lot of a lot of visibility at the event, which was good. I don't know, Elizabeth, if you want to add anything about the booth or your experience. Um, <clears throat> not really. Um, it's just that it's um, super interesting to talk to people who have different use cases for the metrics. And it was, uh, I mentioned this in our community call, but it was really interesting also to hear how people give the elevator pitch based on how they interact with the metrics from our side. You know, so for me, it's all about community and love and let's hug and yeah, be happy, everybody. And for um, others like Ria, who works at HPE, she was explaining how she uses metrics to determine risk. So if she sees a project that she works in compliance there. So if she sees a, a project that ends up on quite a few S bombs, then she knows, hey, maybe I should look into this project a little more because we're really relying on this open source project. So let me just get some more insight about it. So it helps her um, communicate to her engineers and whoever else the level of risk that they are um, working at by by um, depending on this project. So. Um, it, that that part for me was super interesting, um, and I will just add to what Don said is that people who have heard a lot of people have may have heard of chaos, but they don't quite know what we do. Um, when you explain it to them, they are very excited about it, and for people who had not heard about chaos at all, you explain it to them, and they are very excited about it. So <laughs> we I have never in all the conversations I've ever had with people have never had someone say, "Well, that's a dumb idea. Why would anybody? <laughs> why would you care about that?" Like it is. Wow. It, it pertains to virtually every single person that works in open source in some manner. Yeah, it just depends on their context. So, um, and also thank you to those who did uh, help out with the booth. And next time we do a booth, if any folks on this call would like to just take an hour and sit at the booth and talk about chaos, that would be totally great and fine and wonderful. And we would love that. So that's it. Yeah, I thought that worked really well. I mean, typically I've been involved in booths where you're you're kind of stuck there for like three or four hours and um and that gets really tiring. I, I really liked the the kind of quick one hour shifts where people were were changing it up and coming in and out. I thought that I thought that was really good. Yes. I'll, I'll add one thing. The most private most unexpected thing that I heard over the course of the week was the pressure that the US federal government is applying for SBOMs for their vendors. And so the, the whole idea of providing software bills of material for software packages has always been there. And I think everybody has always been interested in providing them. <clears throat> Um, but now that the U.S. federal government, through CISA and the Department of Defense and the White House, is talking about requiring software bills of material for inbound software packages, that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the software <laughs> supply chain participants, um, particularly those that serve the federal government. And so groups, I mean, usually just the big tech companies are, are the providers to the federal government. And I, I really think that this is going to have some cascading effects throughout open source. And I'm not sure how it's going to play out in terms of where legal responsibility is going to reside, um, who's going to inherit the costs of doing this. Um, I'm just not sure. And I have the sense that the federal government is like, <laughs> you all figured it out. And, and they're just kind of pushing it into the supply chain. So I think this is going to be really interesting. I mean, that was probably the most unexpected thing that I heard all week. Yeah, and there are some additional concerns. I spent some time talking to Ava from CISA, and what they were saying was that 
there's stuff that the U.S. government just doesn't want to collect, um, period. Not collect it and anonymize it, but like they just don't want to hold that data, like email addresses. Zero PII. Um, zero PII. And our tools just aren't set up to do that. Our tools collect it all, store it, and then you can anonymize it. But they don't even want to collect it in the first place. That's right. And, and so I think as they continue to, um, you know, to push people toward, you know, certain requirements, I think, I think we're going to have to think about that for our software and, and, you know, somehow have some configuration for not collecting certain things. Um, and I know that technically that's a, a challenge. Certainly. So yeah, I've been. You know, after a couple of years working with Remy and his team, I've got a pretty good perspective on this. And you're right, CISA can't collect PII, but there's other infrastructure in the US government that can and does collect PII. So when it comes to sussing out an attack, it's not gonna be CISA that does it because they can't hold the data. It's gonna be a different agency. But if CISA wants to use our software for other things, they can't right now. Yeah, uh, and and that's going to be true of other, I think, of other organizations as well, especially, especially organizations that do business with the U.S. federal government, which, let's face it, is all of the tech companies. Yeah, go ahead. I see Kelly's hand is raised. And I saw Louise go yeah. off. So, we'll start with Kelly. Oh, I was going to say that um, I'd be curious to see how these like companies or government agencies would feel about the community hosted like platforms that connect to like Augur or a Grimoire Lab because like from like an eight dot interface you don't have access to any personal identifiable information. So you can see the visualizations and metrics, but they're like by nature there's no um individual information. And so I wonder if the community hosted platforms would be able to fit their needs or is it that they need to self host um, because government things. That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, Luis. So what I am hearing is that uh, the restriction is bigger than the restriction applied by the German laws, which are quite restrictive. Is that correct? Are you familiar with the German laws? Basically, uh, if you, if you sure. provide metrics to a, a company in Germany, you cannot offer, for instance, a list of uh, contributions by employee. That's not, uh, that is forbidden. You have to anonymize all the data. So you, you, can, you can collect the data, but the data must be offered in a way that uh, it is, there is no way to identify an employee in the metrics. So you have to uh, anonymize basically by grouping the data in different teams. But uh, even with the German law, you can collect the data. Uh, so, so, the, so the thing that you have to avoid is that uh, the the managers can identify people using the data. So, what I am hearing now is that uh, uh, for these uh, federal, federal units, uh, uh, it is not even possible to collect the 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 PII uh, from the API, right? So, you you cannot collect uh, email right. or name. You don't have we have no there's no public access to the PII. Okay. Yeah, I mean that it's not it's not about public access to it. It's about um CISA not wanting to have that data. Um and so so granted, you know, so my conversation was based on a conversation with one individual who admittedly is in a pretty senior position at, at CISA um and is kind of a security expert. Um so, so I don't know, like, I think they're still figuring out what this means. Um, but I know that they, they don't want to hold, uh, what, what they, what Ava told me was that they don't want to hold any, any PII. I have a follow-up for question for Lewis. Is that only Germany? Cause I know that the EU, um, just had like their cybersecurity policy put out too. Yeah, but but uh, the German laws are are way more restrictive than the others, uh, than, than the European law. So, for instance, in in Europe with the GDPR, uh, uh, the German law is way more restrictive. So, with GDPR, you can you can store uh, PII, but uh, but uh, 
So we don't have this issue, but we've uh, we've discussed about this issue some years ago. So I think I think we should have the idea that in the horizon the tools should be able to to get data without anything related to personal data. And uh, so the thing that we have to do is to discard some metrics that are that need uh, that data. But uh, well, we can we can offer some metrics that are relevant without that data. It from my point of view, the most useful ones are not going to be feasible. But for sure, we, we have a, a set of metrics that can be provided. Yeah, and I think from a from CISA's perspective, I think that they are they are more interested in um, security related things, and and those are necessarily going to be a little bit more repository oriented and less people oriented. So from a community management and community and OSPO perspective, we're very interested in. Um, and the people who are doing the things. Um, I think CISA is a little more interested in the the projects and the repositories and the packages. So, so I suspect their needs will be a bit different. Kelly, you do you have your hand up again, or is that just uh, from earlier? Earlier, sorry. <laughs> okay, no worries. I didn't want to keep talking over you if you still had your if you had your hand up for something new. Are there metrics in chaos um, related to security? Not really. We have we think they touch on it, but the S bomb information I think is core to chaos and also core to securing the supply chain in the eyes of CISA. Well, and Augur has some of the Open SSF scorecard data, so that's right. that's related to security. So I, yeah. think we have, I think we have bits and pieces of it. It hasn't been, historically, it hasn't been a focus for us, but I think that will necessarily change as time time goes on. I think Kelly uh, re-raised her hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I'm trying to see how, how I should say this, especially since this call is recorded. Um, I'm glad <laughs> that we're having this conversation to know that the SBOMs are becoming more and more relevant at like a government level. Because I'll say that I'm aware of a project not owned by Red Hat that is internal to a company that pretty much is like par parses S bombs from GitHub to be able to do like a lot of this risk analysis. And I'm trying to help and push them to open source it. And hopefully, and if that's the case, I probably will try to talk to Chaos to see if that home if that home would make sense here, because it seems like this is going to be a bigger and bigger thing. So my I, I, I'm sorry for being cryptic, but I am <laughs> I'm just uh, I'm going to this was something that was kind of on the side that I had hadn't been focused nearly as much on that I think from this conversation needs to be more of a focus um to see what we can do on parsing s bombs because that's one thing that's really nice is that github now will automatically generate s bombs from repositories like you just have to there's like a bunch of tab for it you press it and it creates it um so it makes it gives a lot more options i have a follow-up question for that does this open ssf scorecard um take S bomb data and generate it into that scorecard or and then if it if it doesn't um, what what could potentially uh, be the outcome of then parsing um, S bombs and bringing it to chaos I don't know I don't think so and then what would come from parsing S bombs not a hundred percent sure either. I, I need to go back and kind of see what this project is, see what a project, what this project that I know about is doing to create the reports and stuff that they're doing based off of S bombs and see, kind of do an audit to see how different is it from compared to the information that we normally get from repositories. How is it the same? Um, but I'm not sure if open SFF does anything with S bombs. If they do, I'm not aware of it. And it's not like a, high level like title to their scorecard. Okay. Thanks for that.
I would like to say something, but I don't find the hand button. I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you, can, you can talk. Yeah, well, well, as long uh, you, you can think of S bombs as as an input, and uh, but the, the thing is that uh, the the very interesting thing with S bombs is that uh, if we if if someone use use uses the tools in the in a deliberate cycle, uh, they can get all the dependencies for a project uh, when it before it is released and run some analysis. So, so this is possible with S bombs. The thing that the, the magic we have to create is okay. We we can we can get S bombs, but uh, with S -bomb, S bombs you don't get the data sources that we need to track. You get the name of the component and the version, but you don't get the repository we have to collect. So uh, we have to create that connection. But for sure, S bombs will be a nice input to be supported by our tools. But it is just a, a, a new input. So maybe in one two years. There is a new format that is awaiting even more more projects, and uh, it's also interesting. So I think that the change is not big with SPOMs. It's just uh, adding a new a new way to add data to the to the data set. Yeah, I mean, an SPOM is ultimately just derived from data, right? Yeah, kind of thinking on that, Lewis, and how do, how would one make that connection? Like how, like if I had the data for an SBOM um, and I know all the dependencies now, um, why do I care about it from kind of the community health perspective? Like what are my questions now? Yeah, well, your questions is that you want to uh, use healthy projects so maybe you are one of your of the of the main projects in your OSPO. Uh, you want to identify the dependencies to see if the dependencies are healthy enough. And uh, in order to ensure that they are healthy enough, you have to analyze the the project health of the dependencies. And the the best way to do this is by analyzing the dependencies in an in an SBOM, for instance. So there are many tools now that you can where you can get all the dependencies of a binary. For instance, of a Docker image, and uh, but doing that, you can you can assess the the health of of some dependencies. Maybe all of them are good enough, but maybe there some of them are, are very risky. So you, as an OSPO leader, should be aware that uh, your main project, your North Star project, uh, is using some dependencies that are very risky. So you should be you should be aware, and maybe you sh you should trigger some actions. Yeah, I see that from like, oh, this is the security health of my project. But then how do I translate that to them saying like, you know, now that my project is, sec is securely healthy, <laughs> I, um, how do I translate that to them saying like, now this impacts my community? Yeah, it, it, it is, the impact is, is it's not direct. It's indirect. That's that's the that's the issue. Yeah. So, but it is important. So let, let's imagine that uh, yeah, if if we think about the log four J or OpenSSL issues in the last decade, uh, OSPON managers will be uh, for sure. Maybe not now, but in the next five years, for sure, they will have this information, and they will trigger some actions because they have the data now, they have the tools, uh, they just have to create the connection. And we are part of, of, of those of those players that we can create the connection. So for sure, it will be something useful to them. So, but of, uh, the OSPOs I know, they are not they are not going that farther, but uh, I'm pretty sure that in the next years, this is, going, this is going to be something trivial, something common. Yeah. I mean, all the components are there. It's just a matter of connecting the, the dots. Yeah, I see that. Anyone else have any comments on this topic? I, th I think this has been a really good conversation um, and really important to continue. Um, 
So just moving on from the SBOM conversation, are there any other topics anyone want to discuss today? Okay. Um, I think then that's all we have. Um, thank you everyone for joining today's call. I think we had a really great conversation on security. Um, I'd love to continue um, the conversation on security as well as uh, conversations on ML and AI and what we could do more to, um, you know, open up some of these opportunities that Kelly has mentioned uh, for, for thinking through data science opposed to just the AI and ML topics. Um, and I think, so we meet in about two weeks. Uh, so hope to see you all there. Thanks for facilitating, Jan, and thanks everybody for the good conversations. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.